Thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, today we're talking about the Internet of Things. And most of you have heard a lot about this in the news or in other, other venues, uh, advertising potentially for companies like Cisco or IBM and others that are, uh, are talking about that. Um, and uh, it can be kind of confusing at times, because we don't know oftentimes what it is or whether it applies and uh, whether you, know, you need to be concerned about it for yourself personally or your own organization. Uh, many of us have these Fitbits and other things like that that you know, are sort of the uh, quintessential Internet of Things in many people's minds. But uh, there's a lot of other critical uh, aspects of that that we need to focus on. Most of us consider these things a little bit more fun and, and maybe uh, medically related in some way, but certainly nothing as serious as an insulin pump or a pacemaker or uh, you know, particularly industrial control systems in a, uh, you know, a factory or in a power plant. Uh, but we want to understand how they all fit together. Uh, and you know, the reality is, is that the, the definitions for Internet of Things oftentimes get even more confusing, and we oftentimes don't even know, you know whether they fit in. But they tend to fall into a particular pattern. And you know, first of all, because the word Internet is in there, we often want to talk about an Internet protocol address, something that's addressable via Internet. Uh, you can debate about whether it has to be on the internet. Most people would say no. You know, it can be in a in a uh, inside a corporate network or in a uh, some sort of other uh, uh, isolated network. But at least it's talking TCP/IP or something else like that. Uh, can it interact with other things? And uh, can people be involved? You've seen you know, subsets of things like machine-to-machine -machine communication as, as sort of quintessential Internet of Things, where one machine's talking to another and you don't have a human in the loop. That's oftentimes considered um, Internet of Things. Uh, but it usually is broader than that. Usually there's some human interaction in many of these uh, situations. Uh, you know, our, arguably, we've, this Internet of Things isn't new. We have concepts like industrial control systems that go back you know, 40, 50, 60 years in many cases, programmable logic controllers, other things like that that have been around for a while that have been programmed, maybe not on internet protocols, but on a variety of other protocols, Modbus and, and other older technologies as well, that uh, you know, do a lot of the things we talk about as the internet of things. Uh, but we know, do know the difference today is, is that they're more ubiquitous. They're involving a lot more people. They're usually not isolated in one particular factory, one particular location anymore. They may be distributed. You could have sensors on a road that are all feeding a centralized place. You could have uh, you know, things like Fitbits that are all feeding to a centralized location to analyze all that data. And of course, we're seeing new stories about self-driving cars and other things and drones and other vehicles as well that um, that allow, uh, you know, allow these things to be dispersed over a wide area and a wide location. So, but that also means that we have you know, increased risk as a result of that. So uh, we don't want to get bogged down in definitions. It's helpful to talk about that. But we, we sort of are in this position now where we sort of know it when we see it. And what we want to talk about, and we'll get to in a minute, is really the individual use cases for what we're concerned with. Because we really can't talk about Internet of Things security in a general context. Because you have everything from Fitbits to uh, you know, uh, uh, PLCs that control power plants. And the risk isn't the same. The types of uh, impacts that we're talking about aren't the same. And so we need to talk about it in that realm. And that's what this risk model is really trying to do, is help you to understand what are the risks that you face in there, and what are you going to face in the future? Because one of the things that we know with this advancing technology is because they all connect together and you have network effects and they become more valuable as you add more of them, we know that that trend's going to continue and that what may be a small risk now can be a bigger risk in the future. So one of the things to think about when we think about Internet of Things in terms of breaking it down is really it can have multiple components. And uh, one of the things to look at when we talk about, of course, is we have the part that interacts with the physical world. It could be a, a sensor. It could be an actuator, something that either uh, you know, collects data in or does something, moves a car forward or does something else like that. Uh, so on either end, you have the collection, the sensors on one end, you have the actuators. Those are the quintessential inner things that we think about, the things that are actually inter interfacing with the world as opposed to, say, a database where it just moves data back and forth. In the middle, though, are really the, the essential ingredients to make these things work. Uh, you wouldn't have a sensor sitting by itself because there would be no use. If there was no place to send its data, 
uh, and to process that data, the sensor wouldn't be valuable. And similarly, if you didn't have some decision-making process, whether it's a human being or a machine, saying to move a plane or a car or to, to do something, uh, then it's, it's really not, uh, certainly not a connected device anymore. It may be just a standalone device, which we've known for about for a while and really isn't an Internet of Thing. So the middle part, you know, oftentimes is where humans are involved, but it's also where a lot of that back-end processing takes place, where you're analyzing lots of data to draw conclusions about water levels or other things that whatever you want to want to do and that will ultimately help you make a decision whether you're going to take an action and of course we know some things are just for collecting you know weather or other things you just want to collect information and then disperse it you don't really want to act on it but then there's other cases where you want to know you want to know okay is this a uh, a good good day to fly this particular airplane, this particular drone in this particular location. Will I collect data and weather and all this other information from various sensors? And then, then that feeds into my decision support system to tell me that I sh should follow this particular path. And the machine's getting smarter enough that can, they can take, take all that information in and make conclusions by themselves. So all of those need to be part of it. And, and when we look at the risks, we need to evaluate everything. Because if we think about it, if we influence the middle pieces by changing that data in some way, by a hack or something else like that, or we you know, change, somebody can control the decision interface and actually cause a car to drive or a drone to fly, that is a significant issue. And we need to make sure that we protect that and not just these end devices. So for a little bit better elaboration, let's talk about a, you know, an, a some particular scenario that may exist in the future, what we may call the Uber of the future, uh, really the, that concept of self-driving cars. So instead of having a uh, driver that receives information from Uber, the car itself just receives that information and comes picks people up. So in that model, of course, you need to have you know, different inf information about the vehicle itself, GPS and other information, where it is, what it is. I know, obviously, if somebody wants to order a car and they've got five people, that's going to influence what kind of car it is. If it's 10 people, they may need a, a bigger vehicle. And so the, the information needs to be fed back, and then that gets sent to uh, some sort of data aggregator that takes all that information um, and organizes it, uh, oftentimes so it can be presented as an option to a consumer to say, you know, just like you look at Uber now and you say, well, there's three Uber cars in my area, you want to present that same information. Of course, it would be all automated. Uh, the customer, of course, is that decision-making source, and they're going to say, I want this. There may be other decisions going into it as well, but that's, that's part of it. And then, of course, you know, the car moves. The person is called, and they move. So that's, again, it's not a whole lot different. The difference, of course, being the last phase, the self-driving cars that we don't see today that can be part of it. So you can see in each of these phases, you know, the consumer saying, I want this, and making sure you authenticate that consumer, uh, and billing information, and all that other information is there, uh, as well as information about the vehicle and where it is and what it's doing. And then, of course, the last stage, which we're still working out and trying to understand a little bit better, uh, about you know, how do we get these vehicles to these locations and interact with the rest of the physical world. Um, and, and so forth. And uh, that, of course, is another challenge that a lot of it has nothing to do with the Internet of Things, but much of it does, which is how do we incorporate all that? And then if we have other drivers on the road and other things, that all gets to be part of it. Um, so that's that one example. And again, there's plenty of cybersecurity threats that we can see just in that one particular scenario that may be of a concern. And we do know that those threats are real. This isn't just speculative in thinking that uh, well, there's, uh, you know, we may, somebody may attack something in the future. They may try to hack into a self-driving car and cause it to go off the road. We know that we have other examples, not necessarily self-driving cars doing that, but of other things. We, certainly the, the one that everybody likes to talk about, Stuxnet. And I hope, has everyone heard about Stuxnet and know something about it? Uh, it was one of the, the, you can debate about whether it was the first example, but it was one of the first areas where you actually had physical destruction caused by a cyber attack. And um, that, that, that was at least, that was, that was intentional. I mean, there's been other uh, mishaps that, that are, were unintentional or not intended that caused damage as well. But at least in terms of an intended attack, it's, it was one of the first. And it certainly was a very sophisticated example of that uh, in terms of all the steps that they went through to get that. So we know that people are willing to do things that are going to cause physical impacts on the world. Uh, 
destroy centrifuges, for example, or, or, or do other things. We know the motivation is there. We also know that there is some capability there, and that in the case of Stuxnet, it was sort of air gap, but there was enough data that, way that they could jump over that air gap to get to that, that device through a USB flash drive or something else like that. And with, with the devices all connected, we know that that threat can be even more pronounced. Uh, insulin pumps, uh, that right now, we don't know of an example of where it actually affected to hurt somebody, but we've seen plenty of examples at conferences where people have been able to hack in, one, one hacker, uh, or pen tester hacked into his own insulin pump and showed how you could affect the, the levels uh, and so forth. So we know it can be done not just directly but remotely as well. Uh, German steel mill, another example, some may say that was the second example of a physical damage caused by uh, a remote hacker where uh, somebody was able to hack into a steel mill, a steel mill in Germany. Uh, they were able to prevent a, a, a blast furnace from shutting down. As a result of that, that caused uh, uh, damage to the device. Fortunately, no one was injured, but uh, we can certainly envision scenarios where that injury or death could occur. And um, again, it's something to recognize the fact that these things, there, is, there are physical manifestations that are happening. It is something that uh, we need to be more concerned with as more devices are connected. Uh, one, one more, you know, sort of everyday example with car washes. Again, this was a test. It wasn't actually real. That uh, Billy Rios was able to demonstrate how he could hack into various car washes. Many of them are automated, and many of them have connectivity back to a central point, and you can do things like uh, affect, uh, you know, how the car wash operates and cause, you know, damage to cars and other things like that as a result of that. Um, and, and again, that's an everyday example that most of us are familiar. It's not just some obscure, uh, you know, plant or other things like that. We all can sort of relate to things like that. And, you know, any of it's gone through, and we know that many of them are very, very automated now. Uh, and then the last one, which was not a cyber attack, um, but it's really a good example of what can happen with the Internet of Things. Tom Sock was a uh, pump storage uh, operation uh, that basically you uh, pump water up during the night when energy is cheap and you store it in a reservoir and then when, during the day when it's more expensive you run it downhill and you run it through some turbines and you create electricity through that. Uh, you know, and the, the, the way that there's a lot, of, there's some technology there that, for example, you want to make sure when you pump the water that it doesn't get pumped too high because uh, it'll lap over the side and, and uh, wash out the reservoir. Well, that's what happened in that in, in 2005 is some sensors became dislodged and therefore they weren't measuring the right water level. And as a result of that, water did lap over the side and uh, caused, uh, got the slide in another slide, Ca caused a lot of damage to the overall environment area. There was, a, it was in a national forest. Fortunately, it was in De December and there weren't too many people there and no one lost their life. It was the, the forest ranger who was close to being harmed. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it, was, it was an example of, uh, we look at it and we think, well, the biggest challenge with Internet of Things is making sure that a self-driving car or drone isn't directed at something bad. But it's an example here of what happens if your data is bad. Because you're still using data to interface with the physical world. And as a result of that, you're relying on that information to take an action, or in this case, not take an action, which was to stop pumping water, um, as a result of that information. So it's incredibly important that we don't just think of Internet of Things in the, in the sense that, it can, that we're say, saying, do this physical event if we rely on that information in any way to tell us what's actually going in the physical world without uh, applying our own sanity checks to it and saying, well, that doesn't make sense, there may be something wrong with that, we can be in for a, a, a world of trouble uh, if we rely too much on the automation to tell us that everything is, is fine and it's okay. And that's one thing that we always need to keep in mind is just simple things like that can lead to big problems if we're not uh, well aware of, of the overall underlying scenario. Uh, but the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, and as, as I related as well to the uh, Internet of Things, is that, um, is that they are very diverse. I mean, you have everything from uh, pacemakers and, you know, electric vehicles that, uh, that uh, potentially could be self-driving someday to, uh, to other devices, smart meters, and, you know, this uh, uh, small uh, um, wind turbine that uh, you can use. Uh, so a lot of these things have different impacts on the world, and it's very hard to talk about them 
in general. So you need to develop your use cases around individual cases. Uh, now, how do you evaluate the risk that you're looking at? Well, you can do it a number of ways. You can look at threats and say, for example, uh, let's look at all the things that people can do bad that we know about and then come up with defenses to that. Uh, that becomes a little bit of an arms race and a little bit of a leapfrog game. And so it isn't always the most useful thing. And many times, the threats aren't always specific enough that you can't always effectively evaluate them. So they're certainly part of your calculation, but they really can't be the only thing that you rely on. Another thing is to look at the vulnerabilities and simply uh, say, you know, what are these things vulnerable? We all hear about in the IT world things like buffer overflows and other vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, you see patches announced almost every day for different vendors. So you can rely on that information, maybe supplement that with other things about the architecture and what fits into it. Uh, you know, for example, you know, embedded systems, uh, they, they put the whole operating system in a lot of these chips that aren't even oftentimes needed. Oftentimes, you only need a small piece of it. But because it's easy, just easier to throw it in there because they don't know what you're going to use it for, you have a whole bunch of new vulnerabilities and unnecessary things that are there as a result of having that whole operating system. Uh, but that's how you get cheap products that you can then incorporate into whatever you want to and not have to customize everything. Uh, you know, manufacturers love to put web servers on just about every um, embedded device that you can find. And it's, sometimes they're useful, but a lot of times they, they open up another avenue for somebody to hack in. Some of these uh, Internet of Things devices, there's no need for them to have a web service device. They're supposed to talk to one device and report information back. Uh, you may be able to configure them directly without having to remotely configure them. Uh, so need to consider what you really need in all that. You know, configuration tools, management tools can be a very a big mess if you think of having hundreds or thousands or millions of these devices. Obviously, if you don't have a way of automatically updating them, patching them effectively, that can be a big problem in, under, in being able to address them effectively and be able to address the risks that you're dealing with. And so those all lead to d different examples of you know, why those things are bad, that you can't patch a hospital elevator because uh, you know, it would lock everybody out if you did that that you have to run Windows 2000 for your MRI because the system can't be upgraded effectively, or you have a robotic arm that will swing a lot wildly if you just send a simple ping command to it because it doesn't understand it. Many of these tr legacy devices really don't, didn't expect to be on a network at all. And now that they are, and if, if you don't send the information to it just right, it can behave in very unpredictable ways. Um, most of the, the newer de Internet of Things devices aren't quite that bad. But um, a lot of them are still designed around expecting certain commands. And if they don't get them, they really don't know how to react. And they can react somewhat unpredictably. And the alternative is, is to focus on the impacts. Is, and this is, this is helpful in a number of ways because it allows you to prioritize, is, which is to start with what is the worst possible thing that can happen with this device? And then we can talk about what are the things to prevent that worst possible thing. And you may say, well, let's just, if we, if we want to prevent that explosion from happening, let's just make sure that there are physical governors and controls that no matter what you do remotely, you can never exceed a particular threshold. Now, that's one of the things that was addressed. Aurora was an example uh, of a demonstration at the Idaho National Labs that they were able, that they did on a generator to show what could happen if you brought that generator onto a grid both in, in and out of phase. And over time, that caused actual damage to the generators you see from it smoking and it caused basically about a million dollars worth of damage as a result of that. And it was really a demonstration of what can happen when, um, when there are not other control controls other than you know, digital controls to restrict its ability to exceed a particular threshold. And so simply just having some other physical uh, device, electromechanical control that just says you can't go beyond this threshold even if a computer says to do it. Uh, could solve part of that problem. Um, you have, the, this is the Tom Sock example I gave, showed you earlier, what happened when water started flowing over the side of that reservoir. Uh, so again, knowing, you know, using video cameras, using other technology to say, well, let's just check that water level from a different perspective. How else can we prevent that impact from happening that, that is, that's so bad? Or we just uh, don't allow pumping beyond a particular, uh, you know, level that could potentially raise that. But you need to have those discussions. And then you work from down from there to the next biggest impact. And at some point, you get to impacts that you can tolerate and say, 
we, now we talk about a cost-benefit analysis that says we really need these devices and they're really useful and being able to communicate with them remotely and control this information is really a useful thing like self-driving vehicles and other things like that. But we need to make sure that you know, we don't have accidents like this, that we actually have um, some method of at least containing the amount of damage that's done. Uh, so an example of self-driving vehicles, maybe it's acceptable to have one accident, but we don't want to create a chain reaction where 100 vehicles are all controlled at the same time by a hacker and are able to cause a much larger accident as a result of that. That's the same issue we see with smart meters and smart grid, where the, the danger of somebody turning off power at your house, while it would be bad for you, for the overall grid, it would not be a bad deal. If somebody was able to send the same signal at the same time to hundreds of thousands of houses to turn off power, that's a much bigger deal. So then you think of ways that you can come up with ways to avoid that particular much worse impact. And as an example of that, that's smart metering. And, and that's where, again, when you look at impacts and you look at your use cases, you actually have to start thinking you know, more, more granularly about what those use cases are. For example, with smart metering, there's a several different goals that you're looking at for smart metering. One is billing, it's to co collect information about usage and everything like that. It may be able to detect voltage drops or look for energy theft. It may be able to also look for you know, other, other uh, use of demand response, which is a way where you can encourage people to use less energy during uh, periods of high demand. And you can actually shut off individual appliances in some cases with that methodology. Uh, but depending upon which one of these are a priority for you and which one you want to be able to use will also dictate what sort of impacts are tolerable for you and therefore what sort of risk model you can adapt for that. And so all of it comes down to what's your objective because a hacker's first objective in many cases is to prevent this objective from happening. So uh, if I can keep you from billing, if I can keep you from uh, communicating with these meters, if I can do other things, that may be one of the objectives. It may be something else. They may want to steal money. They may want to steal customer information. They may want to cause other damage. But this is at least a starting point to say, well, what are the objectives that we want to accomplish? And what, what, what would be the consequences if those objectives were not met? But it gets complicated, and certainly you could spend hours going through this chart of smart grid interfaces, and when you have a lot of these devices communicating with all these different things, it gets very hard to understand how these all tie back to those objectives, because sometimes different devices have different objectives, different devices have different consequences if they're turned off, if they're used in a particular way, if the data is changed. But that's the sort of investigation that as you build out your Internet of Things that needs to be understood is, is what are the consequences in each piece of that? And then how does it affect the whole? Because the, what we've seen a lot of times, particularly in the electric grid, is the consequences of chain, chain reaction. Is that one device may sensibly say, if I see a particular event, I'm going to isolate myself from the rest of the network. Well, the problem with that, as we saw in, South, in, in Yuma, Arizona, that affected Southwest California, was that all the devices acted in one particular way, and that basically caused a blackout of that whole region because of the, the fact that it was not taking into consideration how everything was reacting. And so having, having all your, you need to understand not just how that device should behave, but how it's going to behave in the context of everything else in that network, in that overall ecosystem. And that takes some work and some effort. And a lot of times, these device networks are patched together over time, and you don't really ever centrally think about that. So what that means is really think about anticipation of future use. And that is, is, that is looking at both you know, uh, you know, electric vehicles and connecting them to the grid, but also thinking about energy theft. Uh, vehicle to vehicle to communication is a great thing, but remember there's also road rage and people wanting to you know, send other messages to other people on, on, in, in those, the communications. Home automation, it's a great thing that can help you to save money, it can help you to make your life more convenient, but it also can lead to stalking, can lead to information about how you live your life, getting out to people that you don't want. There was an early example of that when you know, it, wasn't, it really had nothing to do with the Internet of Things, but people were posting up on Twitter or on Facebook, I'm at the bar or someplace else, and somebody created an application called pleaserobme.com, which basically looked at all those things and just highlighted every time people noted the fact that they weren't at home. So it was, and, and these home automation tools are oftentimes beaconing out someplace, informing uh, central systems, oh, the people aren't at home because they've set their settings one particular way or other things like that. So uh, 
in most cases, it requires a lot of effort for a burglar to get all that information. It may not be worth it for him or her. Uh, but for, you know, particularly if you're really concerned about that, you need to make sure that you're not inf letting people know about things that, uh, that you don't want them to know. And then the larger issue about privacy with the Internet of Things has also become uh, very prominent recently. You know, even the Fitbit, for example, is what, you know, I may not care that somebody knows how many steps I walked today, but at some level we may want to know. I mean, if we want to know heart rate information or other things like that. And of course, if I'm a, a VIP or somebody, then I may be targeted for other things. There was an episode on Homeland uh, about a year or two ago where they targeted somebody uh, on their pacemaker and killed them as a result of sending a message, to, sending a signal to the pacemaker. So, uh, you know, those scenarios do exist. And even, even if it's not something that causes me direct harm, like identity theft or physical harm, I still may not want that information out. So, for example, intelligent TV. Samsung put out a reminder that told people that if they're concerned about their information about, you know, what they're instructing their TV or what's going on even in the room, uh, that they should turn off this uh, command feature that some of the Samsung smart TVs has. Because like Siri and like uh, Cortana and some of these other technologies, they don't just receive that information locally. They actually send it back to a central computer so they can improve its ability to interpret what the uh, user commands are of that device. And so it reminded people that if you really don't want that thing out in the cloud, that information out in the cloud, uh, you can turn that feature off. For most people, they don't really care, but it's certainly something that people need to be aware of. Uh, looking at data granularity, I mean, we, we're used to some of our information getting out to the world, but as we get more granular information, that can be used in ways that we didn't really think about. Everything from predicting our purchases to a lot of other things that we don't want to know. Uh, the same goes for data aggregation. Um, we think that well, our data is just one of many pieces of data out there, but if you aggregate enough, you can actually draw conclusions and uh, what we call things like de-anonymizing data. So uh, a medical research study that just collects anonymous information, but there, if there's enough information about the individual, I can go to Facebook, I can go to LinkedIn, I can go to other sources and find out uh, enough about those and correlate to that, to that medical research study, and suddenly all that data is no longer anonymous. Device convergence. Uh, you know, regardless of where we, you know, where we end up, it seems like we, we all want to get to the point where we can do everything with this smartphone or another, and some other smartphone. And that's, that, of course, is, you know, get, gets back to, you know, goes against what we sort of intended with Internet of Things, which is that they were single-use devices and they weren't all coming back to a central place. And now we're looking at it and saying, well, I can integrate my health data and my smartphone and everything else like that. That may be useful and it may be the right thing to do, but it's something to be aware of because you have more of that data essentially on one device and that one device then can be hacked or, 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 or taken advantage of in a number of ways. And then you have the seeming knockers to the insidious, a child playing with a, a radio control plane versus you know, uh, some scary drone out there. And so uh, some of this is really subjective in deciding what you're willing to tolerate in a society. Uh, and that's a debate that we all have to have. Those of you in state government, that's something that you have to deal with your citizens. We've had to deal with this with drones and flyovers now for a few years in different jurisdictions where, you know, is, is it okay for them to fly over, you know, any uh, piece of property or does it have to be their own property and uh, even interfering with firefighting in a couple of stories and things like that. And so this is really a, dis a discussion not so much about security or about anything, but just what society is willing to tolerate. And that has to be considered within the discussion as well. You can't do it, do those things in isolation. So in order to build that risk model, we need to bring in all the pieces that we just talked about, the threats, the vulnerabilities, the impacts, to be able to pull it in. But the first part is really about that use case and being defining it very specifically in what your objectives are. Uh, this isn't really new. We've done that with any IT project. We've done that with other things before. But a lot of times, we don't often think about how we're going to use that. And with Internet of Things, because they can expand and we grow, you can build a, a network infrastructure that allows you to have various types of data ride on it and not really think about things like the performance considerations. I mean, as I tell utilities, when they talk about smart grid and metering, it's like, if all you want to do is collect data for billing, you need a very low bandwidth network. It doesn't have to have a lot of reliability, because if the data doesn't come through now, you can get it later on. 
If you suddenly want to do a lot of other things using that same network, you need to have expanded performance, your reliability has to go up, you may not be able to piggyback on, on existing uh, telco networks anymore because they have a particular service level that they're advised to meet that may not be acceptable to you. But unless you know those use cases, you can't answer any of those questions. And so for communities that are building these infrastructures, the wireless infrastructures, other infrastructures that may ha allow these Internet of Things devices to piggyback on, you really need to think about what are the particular performance considerations, what are the security considerations that you're allowed. And then get that message out and saying, if you're using it for these uses, that's fine. If you want to do it for these other critical uses, we advise you to have a separate sort of communication, either landlines or, or even your own networks using your own frequencies. Uh, you know, identify all the relevant impacts. You, know, you can't identify everything, but certainly the biggest ones to, uh, you want to look at. The likely vulnerabilities, you're not going to know about all of them. A hacker tomorrow is going to come up with a new vulnerability you didn't realize was there. But you can understand things like attack surfaces and other things like that and decide where are the likely places that someone's going to attack and is that tolerable within whatever application you're using. And then finally, identify the threats. And you don't want to go overboard with that because there's threats that will pop up tomorrow that don't exist today. Uh, one of the biggest responses we always see from customers when we talk about all these bad attacks is, well, you know, nobody's really interested in me because I don't really have anything that interesting or useful or, or valuable to a hacker. But we've seen time and time again people come up with new ways, like the, the ransomware that we've seen recently. The hacker doesn't have to care whether the information that you have is valuable to them at all. All they need to know is it's valuable to you. And if it's valuable to you, they can hold it ransom and say, give, us, give me some money if you want it back. Uh, and that's the, so it's the easiest response to people that say, well, I don't really have anything that's valuable. Well, if it's not valuable to you, then, then you have to ask why are you keeping it at all? Why are you doing that? Why are you in business at all if you're doing that? But um, all those things need to be considered without getting into understanding who this nation state is or all, their, all, those, things, all those other characteristics. So other considerations, externalities, uh, particularly for state governments, that's incredibly important. Some may say in government there really isn't an externality because they are concerned about a lot of things. But you know, the, the spillover and what we, pollution is the typical externality, but there's a lot of others, which is uh, a lot of times the device owner is only really concerned about the harm of that device or the immediate things around it. Uh, but what does that affect others? And you know, if you build out this network that other people decide to use and they become to rely on it, what sort of obligations does that create for you as well? Uh, you know, reputational harm only, you know, harm only goes so far. Uh, you know, you also need, if you're regulating, you need to think about that issue as well. It's just like, where is this going to lead to? And what are the considerations? How are people going to make use of that? Uh, and then identify all the stakeholders. And this, this is, again, gets to the externality to question where you're actually talking about not just the people whose data you're collecting or the environment you're collecting in, but anybody who may want to use that information. And you can't go too far with that, but to say if you're collecting weather data, uh, you, know, you know that people are going to use that information for deciding you know, whether they bring an umbrella to work or something else like that. But you may also have people that are doing very critical jobs where bad weather can cause loss of life, for example. And so you want to caveat that by saying, what level of reliability can we assure those community people? Uh, you have data custodian, you have regulators. Everyone needs to be considered at some level. If you're a small company, obviously you can't get overly concerned about too many other people. If you're a government entity, you do have to make sure that all these people are, are brought into the picture. So what you're left with then when you look at Internet of Things is you start out with this base risk, which is you know, probability times impact, the likelihood of some event happening times the impact of that event. Um, and, but that only, that's only part of that. You know, that's, that's a formula that we've known for years that we do in IT. The other part that we need to consider is the, the risk for future use and future misuse cases. And again, we can't go crazy with that, but we do have to think about how this network, how this device, how these things, how it can be used in the future. This Fitbit that I have now, can I upgrade the firmware in a way where it can send information to my doctor on a regular basis? Suddenly, that becomes uh, you know, a lot more valuable, potentially, to me, but a lot riskier. Because if the wrong data goes to my doctor, 
and you know the doc and, and it doesn't send the right data out the doctor may not tell me when I need to come in for example um, if I'm doing a more advanced medical device or something else like that I may uh, you know I, I start to rely on it right now you know knowing how many steps I took is probably not going to change how I uh, operate my health but it's suddenly if I know that if my heart rate goes above a particular level that I need to take a particular action take a pill do other things like that uh, I need to be able to think about that. So if these devices start extending beyond what they're being used for now, I need to be aware of that, need to have a consideration. It may be just a warning to say, don't use it for this purpose, because it wasn't designed that way. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, but it used to be Microsoft on their, some of their uh, end user license agreements had a little warning, because they included Java sometimes. This, is, this Java software should not be used in nuclear power plants. It was actually specifically called out for that notation. And so it's one of the examples where you may want to say, future use case, we don't know of any nuclear power plants using it now, but if anyone want to use it, don't use that for that purpose. Um, and for Internet of Things, that's, that's incredibly important. You may have sensor devices and other things that you may say they're not hardened for a particular environment, for uh, particular emanations and, and radio frequencies and a particular other things like that. Don't use it for that purpose. And that may be all you need to do with the future use cases, just identify the places where people shouldn't use it. But if you do anticipate a use, have a plan for how it can actually be implemented. Future aggregation of risk and other things. This is where we talk about the issue of where everybody relies on the same thing. We're in a world now where everybody is using iPhones and Samsung and maybe some other smartphones, but certainly I I I iOS and Android. That becomes an issue where you have everybody from first responders to other people that all rely on the same type of you know, operating system, the same type of threat, that if that were not to work, suddenly you're not just talking about databases going down and not being able to distribute money. You may be talking about first responders not being able to get to fires because they're relying on an Android or an iOS device that's not giving them that information because everybody's using it because that's where the market's going. And being aware of those consequences if everyone is using that same thing and that device were to fail. And so what, what are you relying on? We know about network effects. We know that things are going to build out in a certain way based on economic efficiencies and other things like that. And we need to be aware of, of what those impacts could be. And then harm to other stakeholders not anticipated. And again, this is somewhat speculative, but it needs to be at least documented and understood that there may be other people that may be exposed in a particular way. Like we said, with weather data that we rely on sensors, people that rely on that information that we just didn't even anticipate we're going to rely on. We may not be able to do much about it, but just be aware of it. And then what you get out of that is extrapolated risk. And you can then start to understand not just how much does it cost to implement today with the technology I have, but what risks am I going to be facing? And then that will answer your question about balance that against the efficiencies you're going to gain with implementing these devices. So options for mitigating those risks, uh, you have the, uh, uh, you know, one option is the fit for purpose idea. You know, don't use it for nuclear power plants is a, is a very more limited one, but to say only use it for particular applications. That, uh, for example, this drone can only be used for, for observing agriculture in a remote region. You can't use it in a city. You can't use it in anything else like that. And the way it communicates with a centralized computer means that uh, it can't work anywhere else. That's generally unrealistic when people figure out that they can use these things for not just observing agriculture, but say in delivering packages for Amazon. We know that you know, that's gonna, there may be a use case that gets developed out of that because people want to use what's already available. So we, we need to be able to be at least uh, document how it can be used in ways that there should be additional risk considerations if you decide to use it for other things. Uh, but that's limited use purpose, limit purpose use is actually creates more liability in some cases under some of the, the tort liability laws because Microsoft and most software vendors generally are not liable for the risks associated with their software uh, because it's for a general purpose use. If they suddenly could anticipate what that use was, then, then suddenly their, their liability could actually go up. So it may not always be a good thing. But you want to clearly at least to document the assumptions and provide for close oversight where those device, uh, diversion device owners. Um, you know, mandate uh, you know, vetted protocols. If it's a particular critical use, you, uh, like, like a, a, a medical device, the FDA may want to say, uh, this, is, this is how you're going to implement it. And you can't, you can't stray from that implementation in terms of protocols, in terms of other implementation. 
um, device certification may be an ultimate issue as well. Uh, you know, different options, you know, make sure you develop a detailed use case, you know, review insurance coverage, uh, and make sure you do ongoing reviews. Don't just stop after you've implemented. Continue to review it, look at the risks, particularly privacy risks, and where that's going to be going. This is an example I won't go into detail, for, and you can get this online too. Cloud Security Alliances, this is their recommended uh, in Internet of Things controls. Uh, you know, I would, again, you know, the devil's always in the details. There's, these are fine at a high level, but then you need to actually delve in a little bit deeper and look at those and understand those and how they affect your own environment. Um, you know, apply, you know, good security engineering practices is certainly one, one method of, of making sure that actually happens. Uh, so applying what you learn, I mean, at the very least, you need to know where your exposures are. You need to understand, you know, how this risk model may apply to your organization today, tomorrow, in the future. And then if you have an initiative or a project, be able to apply it when that happens. Um, you know, even if you don't control them, understand the risk that you may be affected. Uh, if it's not even your device, but you may be impacted from a drone or from a, other things, you may get data from weather and you want to know what are the, the, the likely, uh, you know, errors in that that could affect your reliance on it. Uh, document it and allow people to make sure that they make their decisions based on information. So, we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, we're just about running a little, we've got about five minutes or so. So, any questions that anyone have about the presentation? I know I ran through a couple of slides a little quick, so. Yep. Right, and bake in the ability to upgrade in large networks. You know, we've seen this with smart meters where 100 meters or 1,000 meters is fine, but as soon as you have 10,000 or 10 million meters, suddenly that whole upgrade model falls apart. You know, same thing with vehicles. You know, if you, Tesla has a small, small fleet right now, when they go up to 10 million or 20 million, can they still push it out the same way without having lots of lags or without causing congestion problems? All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, appreciate it. I think uh, was it lunch next or something? So thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>